Well, uh, you you have to be watching this on YouTube because uh, we, as as you may or may not know, we're making a little move for the podcast. So that feed will be popping up in in, in the, the coming weeks. We have some exciting news to announce there. Uh, but as you can see here on the YouTube right now, Smiley Kaufman wearing his Baker's Bay hat, fresh off a little tropical vacation, three rounds of golf in here. Uh, I'm Charlie Hume. I played much less tropical golf this weekend in a very <laughs> frigid Durham, North Carolina, very wet Durham, North Carolina. Uh, had our had our season opener tournament postponed. <laughs> really hated that, uh, but still still got the boys out on Saturday, made it work. But let's let enough about that. Let's talk about Baker's Bay. Let's just get started right there. Uh, <laughs> what, what was it like to be back, and how was the golf? Uh, <laughs> I was looking like for a plaque out there or something, you know, with, uh, <laughs> with, with, uh, you know, you know, like you've seen on like 18 at Bay Hill of the famous shot that that guy hit in the middle of the fairway. Um, I was kind of looking for a plaque on 18 that said something like, you know, Smiley Kaufman played here at one point, but he doesn't remember the hole. And that's the 18th hole at Baker's. So it was nice to see that hole exist out on that golf course. I was going to say, like, like it should either be a bronzed phone that has like the Snapchat app open or it should be like uh, or like a, a drink, like a tequila drink or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Or, or uh, what was what was the What were you using as a microphone? Uh, the anything I found. Week? Anything, anything you found. I found. Yeah. One of those three things would suffice in terms of, of commemorating the week you had there. <laughs> I'll I'll say that the golf course, you know, I remembered all the holes and I'll say that because when I go back and look at the old videos from like 2016 and 17, we were out of play a lot (laughs) and going back and playing this week, I really was never out of play. And, and that was, I think more credit probably to that. There was very little wind the two days I played. But still, I just laugh at some of the places that that Ricky, JT, Jordan and I hit the golf ball uh, uh, at Baker's Bay. But it's kind of grown in a little bit more The they had a terrible hurricane a couple years back oh. and have totally rebuilt the place up. And uh, the place is just incredible. I mean, it's a 10 out of 10. It was a perfect weekend. Uh, great time with the fam. Uh, got to grind a little bit on uh, on the golf game. Uh but uh, I, I think I know what I'm working on. I, I feel like I'm in a, de- a better place. I saw this guy on YouTube tell me everything I needed to work on with my game. Uh, I don't know if you saw that comment. On our- <laughs> oh, yes. Like like the 12 or 13 paragraphs. I was like, I was like too long, did not read. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, well, let's say this. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for putting your time and energy and trying to uh, correct uh, the high yaws that Smiley had. We, uh, we Later in the show, we're going to get to just kind of <laughs> reacting to that. What we're referring to here, of course, is the front nine at Spyglass Hill, the we premiered on YouTube earlier this week. Uh, super appreciative to everyone who showed up to watch that, who commented. Um, it, we, we'll, we will dig into that later on the show. But yes, one of the comments was uh, an essay length uh, analysis of your swing. And he was start talking about P2, P3. And like, I, I'm lost. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I'm gone. I- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it was, uh, you know, maybe more family friendly trip. Was it? What was the golf crew? Was it was were the golf crew and the family separate, or did we get a little Anna Carter cameo in the chorus at all? Yeah, she came out. She's uh oh. played played with uh, my brother in law James and my father in law Wayne, and uh, the girls came and joined us out, like kind of like near sunset a couple days. And Anna Carter was like crawling around the green, but she loved putting the golf ball in the hole. Like that was her thing. Yes. She would go find a ball. Walker and she does the same the thing. I love this. Put it in. <laughs> so. That made me excited. It's like, all right, cool. Looking forward to the summer, late, late summer nights to where we can bring her out on the golf course and just kind of, you know, just let her roam, you know, just kind of be free. (laughs) Well, that is such a perfect segue. First of all, just just show the audience your shirt here, please. The girl dad shirt. Uh, We were it was (laughs) it was a great day to be a golf dad because I was sitting up here in my office working on the the finishing up the edit for the back nine of Spyglass Hill that's dropping this week and watching Peter Malnati come down the stretch of the Vals bar and final puck goes in his four-year-old son runs up to him on the green uh, with a cape on and he picks him up and he's doing this teary interview and I'm coming off 
Friday, 44 degree weather, took Walker out with my wife. He could not have been happier. We were bumping Kygo in the golf cart. He's bouncing up and down, took him out in the greens. He just started walking. So he's, he'll take two golf balls out and he'll walk and put it in the hole. And so, you know, just as, as good as it gets in terms of making your heart full as a father on the golf course. I also have to give a shout out to one of our fans. I think his name is Evan Cantrell who reached out. Yes. A fan of the pod, friend of the show. Uh, who's like the golf dad stuff is, is my favorite content on the show. So Evan, this is for you, but, but anyway, so coming off of that on Friday and then sitting up and, and listening to, to Peter's uh, post win interview, I'm like, yeah, I'm, uh, it's, it's whatever it's 6 PM. And I'm just crying alone in my office because that is, <laughs> <laughs> that is being a dad, that is being a golf dad. And, and it was really, really, you know, kind of moving and cool. Um, I, I, you know, I think we will kind of dig into the tournament itself and stuff like that. But I mean, just top line reactions. I mean, being a dad in golf, how how cool was it seeing where, where you know, how much that meant to him? And not only just the win, but just, you know, having his wife there and his two sons there. I mean, that that was really, really moving stuff. Listen, I think that's one of the things that I always kind of dreamed of, you know, when uh, when. Francie and I got married. It's like, you know, I would love to one day, you know, have a kid and win with my kids there to watch me. Um, obviously, now I think we might have to change whatever that win may look like, whether it's, you know, me beating Charlie in a match. Like maybe that's <laughs> the big win on uh, maybe it's a member member match play season long thing that just it just means more, you know, having her on the 18th green to greet me with a member member title. Maybe that's the, where the bar is set now, but <laughs> to your point about Peter, first off, he's always been the kindest dude on tour and there's no mm. person that's deserved that kind of bar uh, sponsorship that he has. <laughs> I don't know if he still has it, but it was, I mean, it was perfect because he legitimately is the nicest dude on tour and, you know, we've kind of seen his name pop up a lot, obviously, with the sponsor's invite that he got in Pebble that was very highly debated, but a very involved policy more board member that has really kind of put out a lot of quotes this year that have made headlines. You know, for a guy that I would say that nobody really follows Peter Malinaudi's week to week scores for the most part, unless you're a friend or a family member of Peter's. He's kind of found headlines because he's on the policy board and 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 granted, I think he's very well spoken um, in what he in in the things that he says. And I think he speaks well, uh, not only for himself, but I think for, you know, the guys on tour that that I think the way he quoted it was 90 percent of the guys don't get to set their schedule. They don't prepare their their schedule uh, around the majors. They they get in play in what they get in. And I think that moment on 18 with Peter to me was really cool because it was emotions of, man, golf is really, really hard. You know, the ups and downs of this game of, of just having to keep going every single day, doing the same thing over and over again and working on stuff that a year ago may now just be paying dividends. Mm. You know, he may have struggled for six months on, on I, I first off in, in Jackson this year, I'm on the Peloton bike and he's, he's in there. I'm kind of in the workout room in Jackson, which felt odd because all the guys are working out and I'm just a broadcaster, but Peter's <laughs> over there. Pelotoning it. <laughs> he's got this, he's got this swing speed stick and it's just going whoosh. Whoosh. I mean, it just absolutely sending it righty. And then he went the other way and started swinging the speed stick lefty as hard as he could. Just, I mean, just going at it. And if you've seen Peter's golf game over the years, for the most part, he's not a guy that hits it very hard. Mm -hmm. When I used to play with him on tour, he was the one guy that if anybody asked me, it said, who's like the guy that gets a lot out of his game that like, how was he on tour? Peter Malnati was that guy. I'm just like, how is, how is he beating me? I, I, I hit it harder. Like I hit more shots, but we add up the scores and he beats me that day. And it's just like, what is he doing? Like, it's so frustrating, but Peter's kept his card for nine or so years now, which is just incredible considering how, where his talent level is, but, how 
uh, he's a guy that just knows his golf game and has continued to work on his weaknesses and make them strengths. And well, I think he's gotten longer over the years. And I think Peter's a guy that, listen, for him to win on the PGA Tour at you can't call him a journeyman by any means. He's a guy that's kept his card every year. I don't know what journeyman category uh, where that is, but Peter's a guy that's, you know, he's exceeded a lot of people's expectation, probably his own. And so for him to get the win and birdie 17 and uh, you know, take, take the tournament and make it his, I mean, Cameron Young was right there on the doorstep and that's, kind of what we expect Cameron Young to do is to go, hey, it's like, I, I can take down Peter Malnati. You know what I mean? No, 100%. And and, and Cam is is definitely uh, on the agenda to kind of get to hit the way he finished the tournament. Um, yeah, I mean, I w- w- with Peter, first of all, uh, if you're if you're a dad and you're giving him grief for the yellow golf ball, you can you can also stop that right now because we learned this week that that was his now four year old son. His three year old son said, you know, Dad, I, I like the yellow golf balls, and that's why he decided to play it. So yet another oh, heartwarming that the backstory. That's the backstory. So I I am done critiquing the yellow golf ball. If his son asked for it, I, that's uh, more power to him. Uh, but but just on the topic of. Um, you know, his, his place in the game, you know, and you kind of talked about it, getting the sponsor exemptions as a policy board member and him sort of being the, the de facto, you know, spokesperson for the little guy on the policy board, the, the journeyman representative on the policy board. He had an interesting, uh, a long sort of first quote in, in, in the, the post win press conference he did. I'm not going to read the entire thing. Even the portion I'm going to read is pretty long, but I think it's interesting in the context of a lot of stuff we've talked about in the past year or so, the changing nature of the tour, the changing nature of, of just various events on the tour and just the, the stratification of the tour, whether the regular tour or the, the platinum tour or whatever we're calling it. Um, so he, he said, I feel like this win, first and foremost, is for me, it's for my family, it's for my caddies, it's for my team of people who support me. But on a larger scale, it's also, it's for Tampa, it's for the Copperheads, it's for Valspar, it's for all the events on the PGA Tour who find themselves in this new ecosystem, kind of wondering where they fit and if they matter, because I wanted, I said this out there because I wanted the Copperheads and the people of Tampa and the people from Valspar to know that there are thousands of Peter Malnati's out there who are 10 years old right now, teenagers right now, who dream of playing golf on the PGA Tour, and they want to have the moment that I just got to have. If we don't have communities that believe in what the PGA Tour does and sponsors who support what the PGA Tour does, we don't have those moments. You know, it, it's interesting. I mean, I think it's look, I'll I'll pardon Peter for getting caught up in the emotion and you know <laughs> what what this what the who this win is for, but I, I think there is is an element in there that's interesting to discuss, which is, you know, we're looking at a tour that now has these limited field, no cut signature events and you know, Valspar is one of the events that got asked to expand their field to create more opportunities for guys who didn't get into some of these early season events. Um, and, you know, I, I just wonder for you where this whole, you know, th- this event and specifically Peter's win registers in terms of what the tour looks like going forward, you know, because, because we, I guess I, I have to wonder if we do have players like this getting these opportunities going forward, you know, in 2025 and beyond. Well, I just think about, you know, the live guys, uh, that are that are currently playing on the live golf tour and, and just kind of going through my head you know john rom bryson dechambeau like those guys didn't play at valspar you know what i mean like these are the, the players that we're talking about never really teed it up at valspar i mean i think maybe cam smith used to play that was a a pretty good course fit um but you know it's i think it's just going to be highly debated right now charlie just mm-hmm. because of I think there's just a perception that there's no depth on the PGA tour and that the, the tours are just so split that if you don't have the live guys that then a Valspar was not going to matter or a cognizance not going to matter. And whether that's right or wrong, I don't know how correct it is because you're only talking about 20 or so players that really can, can come in and maybe just maybe add names um, throughout the leaderboard that you recognize. But but still, the leaderboard's going to be what it is on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> there's no guarantee that AM Answer is going to play well um, at the Valspar to to make you turn the TV on. They still got to go out and play well. And and John Rahm was a guy 
that that never really teed it up there. So how this affects all these other smaller smaller events, I, it's really tough to say because you know these events have always kind of struggled to get all of the stars to play. They've they've been pretty good about getting you know five to eight really solid names and that'd be enough. And that was always fine with the events. But I think there's this perception that all of these events used to have all the top players and that's just not true. Yeah. Well, let's talk about one guy who feels like he's been in budding star stage for a number of years now and just has been knocking on the door of getting that first PGA tour win so many different times. And we look up on a Sunday and he's right there. Uh, you know, with a couple holes left to play, he's tied with Peter Malnati for the lead 11, 11 under, and that's Cam Young. And, you know, I just, for me, this felt like this was the opportunity. This is where he could get it done. He'd get it done on a tough course. Mm -hmm. um, one that, you know, listen, as a guy who is a, a, a bomber and, and it can be a little bit all over the map, like this would have been a really nice resume win for him getting it done on a course that can be tight and can be tough. Um and so he he the last couple of holes he gives himself a look for 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 birdie on seventeen that's about seventeen feet so not a slam dunk birdie look but you know definitely makeable it's a good and, shot and, in the seventeen you know good shot in the seventeen and then eighteen you know pulls his drive left had a ton of tree trouble hit an incredible wedge on the green uh, to give himself a chance to two putt and at least you know put a little pressure on Pito Malnati who of course birdied seventeen behind him and, and had a one shot lead going into eighteen. But leaves that that first putt nine feet short and has like a really tough par look to put some pressure on Peter Monati does not make bogeys in all. And from there, it's, you know, I mean, Peter hit his hit his second shot on the green from that that fairway bunker, but really could have pitched out and, and had a lot of room to make a bogey there and still win the tournament by a shot. Uh, what do you make of of? just cam young's week in, in general and, and just and where do we where do we stand on him right now because even going back to last year it's a guy who had struggled and you know he was i think eighth or ninth in the Ryder cup standings but really people didn't you know bat an eye when he didn't get picked you know it was more, it was more of like a you should have taken keegan or there were other guys like cam young it's like yeah we kind of get why he didn't go <laughs> well i mean i think a guy looking at his stats on the week guy like cameron young when you're first in strokes gained off the tee for the week, I know the 18th is a very difficult driving hole. I think it's one of the more, I mean, really, it's a really tough driving golf course. But if you're a guy that's striked it around the entire week off the tee, you can't get up there and not put that ball in play. It's just, if if you if, if Cameron Young is going to take that next step, he's got to be able to give himself a 10-footer for birdie on 18. If he's going to be the guy that's going to, play to his talent level, which is a top 10 uh, player in the world. That's how talented the player mm -hmm. that Cam Young is. And if you compare him to other types of players in the game today, I would say that maybe Wyndham Clark would be a, a good example of a player that it's similar to him and that hits it really hard. You know, mm -hmm. I would say mentally both are have been weak in their careers. Um, I think Wyndham has taken strides to where he's now that cocky, swaggy player where before he was just kind of a hot mess. You didn't really know who Wyndham was. He was a frustrated golfer, someone that you didn't really know who he was. And I think Cameron Young's the same way to me. I, I watch him. I don't really know who he is. Um, I know the type of golfer that he is. But I don't think we know as a as a as an analyst, as a viewer, who he is yet. And I think that's one thing as uh, someone who's a fan of his, that's like, are, are we going to be the guy that closes out events? Are we going to be a personality? Are we not going to talk and be cocky? Like, I just uh, it, it's uncomparable to anybody that that's ever come up in the last 10 years, because Guys that have come up have had personality. They've had some swagger. Cameron Young's just come out and said, "You know what? I'm just, just really good." I mean, he's he's probably the most equivalent to Dustin Johnson mm -hmm. <laughs> of anybody oh, yeah. that's 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 come up. And, and I would probably get that would be my best player comp, I'd say. But but DJ got it done. He's I would put Cam Young in the Tony Finau category as of right now as somebody who could not or he still has not won. But Tony Finau took forever to win and just top 10 to death. Well, I think those are all interesting and unique comps because I think that 
like I, with DJ for sure, there's like that smooth sort of effortless power that that's just you know you know almost at times you look back early in DJ's career, it's like almost this untapped power of like if he mm-hmm. can harness this and do something with, it, he's going to be incredible. I think Wyndham and and Tony Finau are really interesting comps because you know if you look at a guy like Wyndham. Um, you know, he, he, when he made like the early, he was looking for something with the putter. He, he, you know, his play, plays with Ricky a lot. He goes that jailbird, jailbird early along, early on and finds something and then puts himself, you know, wins the Wells Fargo, you know, puts himself in contention, wins the U S open. And then like, you know, look at this year, it's like, you know, Wyndham to me, I don't think of as being one of the best putters on tour, but I think of him as a guy that who is one of by far one of the best ball strikers on tour. And when he runs into a hot putter, Forget about it. And you know, where do we see that earlier this year? The AT&T Pro-Am. It's like the guy was making a historic amount of putts, and it was just, you know, no question. Like, he's going to run away with the thing. Finau, I think, is is a good comp for, for that same reason, where it's like a guy that has all the talent in the world and just is trying to figure it out in the green and – you know, it's like some weeks it, it, it's just it's so it just lacks consistency. I feel like it's like a guy that, you know, if he could find something consistent on the green, he'd, he'd contend every single week. And and as it stands, it's like he's he has something that it maybe is comfy to him. So some weeks it works and, and he's in contention. Sometimes he wins. And we saw we saw that a couple of times last year with Tony V now. Yeah. But when it doesn't. It's just you don't – and, and it, when you go cold for a while, it's just – it's a tough scene. And I, I, I don't know what to make of that. And I don't, and look, we, we – golly, I mean, putting, we've talked about so many different guys with going hot and cold with the putter. I mean, Scotty Scheffler, you know, the last couple, you know, weeks, months, years really, like find something and now, you know, we feel like it's all fixed. But, I mean, that to me, I'm just curious there, like – if you feel like Cam's a guy that needs to go go out and get a putting guy to kind of work on that part of his game, he has the ball striking talent and the strength and, and you know the speed there, but it feels like that part of the game is the one that he's got to figure out if he's going to start winning. No, he definitely does, but I, I still think putting is something that I, I don't see as like just this crazy weakness. I, I've seen him make tons of putts. Uh, to me, I, I think the side of the game – for him, you know, like when I think of Tony Finau and and just not being able to close the door and win a golf tournament, there either guys have just this closing mentality and and just this look that they're going to get the job done, or they don't. And to me, Cam Young, he he's not a guy that has that to me. Like he doesn't mm. show um, that he's that he has this weakness that he's that he's not going to close a golf tournament. He, he doesn't look scared. I don't know exactly what it is. I, I I almost attribute a little bit towards 72 holes of of just temper and frustration and not being able to bottle his emotions and use them positively. So hmm. I think it's a totally different element that that other guys are not used to. You know, a lot of these guys, like for instance, like Keith Mitchell this week, I would attribute him not winning today being to like more to nerves and just having a round that's not even close to any of the rounds he had all week. You know what I mean? It's just like a uh, an outlier 77. To me, that is more nerves than anything. But like a guy like Cameron, Cameron Young, I don't see those nerves as much as I do with a guy who's – and I, I, I'm using Keith as an example this week, but let's use any other PGA Tour guy who's in the final group and just looks tight, doesn't want to win the golf tournament. Cam Young doesn't have that that look to me. So there's something statistically like you're talking about maybe with this putting that he needs to improve on, but I think it's more the mental side of the game that he needs to improve on, on just like – talking cocky and swagger like like Wyndham Clark has like he needs to start convincing himself he is the elite dog that he that that we all see I think he needs Mm -hmm. to start carrying himself and talking a little bit more that way well uh one note just going out on cam uh you know we started with a very heartwarming you know father moment for Peter Malnati and and here are the ups and downs of being a father because he was asked in his press conference after you talked all week about how well you handled your emotions what are the emotions like right now and Cam's answer was I don't know honestly I realized I wasn't going to win pretty quickly and I have a four-hour drive home with a one and a two-year-old so whatever (laughs) emotions are attached to that and you know it just like in the same way that you know watching Peter Malnati hold his son hit home for me that also hits home for me too so Cam 
damn. Hope- I can't even imagine what <laughs> song was like played in the back seat. Just <laughs> Baby yeah. Shark. Is that what's being played in the back seat as you drive off of Copperhead? Just like man <laughs> oh gosh it's like well that's over um you know i i don't I, maybe i've given cam too hard of a time on this and I, i'm it's a different hard time you know i'm not i'm not saying like man you should have won that golf term it's more of of okay we need to win we need to figure out how cameron young needs to win mm-hmm. so what are we going to do and 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 what do we need to do and you kind of mentioned the putter but i think it's more working on the temper and the frustrations throughout 72 holes I think it's a completely fair point. I, I think you nail it when you say he's not a guy that looks like he's afraid of the spotlight. If anything, he feels like he has a really, you know, he, he's, he's, he's got it there, but yeah, I mean the, the frustration piece, I, we've, we've seen that at times that that's not like out of pocket to say. I yeah. Think. I've it's seen, just, yeah. I've seen it on the golf course and listen for a guy like him to go to, you know, contend in major championships, like just coming out and finishing, Come, you know, battling Rory down the stretch at, at San Andrews. I mean, come on, dude. Like, these are things yeah, that he's been there. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it doesn't show the nerves. That's what I'm getting at. It's like he's a he's a killer and he needs, he needs to remember that he's a killer and he needs to start getting that Brooks Wyndham just fig jam. Yes. I mean, yeah, like that, that sort of, you know, that line between, you know, uh, being such a perfectionist where you're it's all negative self-talk because, you know, you can do so much better and, you know, just having almost an irrational confidence, but one that gets you over the line to where, you know, you're hitting a bad shot and it's not like beating yourself up because you want to hit the perfect shot. It's it's like, yeah, yeah, I, I can score from there. I can figure it out. Like, I'm going to win this golf tournament. You know what I mean? And, and I don't know. And so, yeah, so maybe the best place to start is not a punting coach. It's a sports psychologist. And he to, may already be working on that. But, yeah. I mean, to me, dude, if Paul Tesori doesn't work out for you as a caddy, I think you have to look at yourself in the mirror. I really do. I think Paul Tesori yeah. is one of the best caddies on the PGA Tour. And that was legitimately a match made in heaven for a guy like Cameron Young with the talent that he has. It's like, how how do you not make that work? He's legitimately a player, or excuse me, a a player, a former player that, that is, you know, had so much success with Webb, you know, Charlie, like to me, that is a, is a bit of a red flag in the fact that if you can't make that work, it's like, okay, maybe there's something underneath the hood there that, that uh that needs to be looked at from from uh from Cameron's standpoint. Yeah, I, I remember Paul an interview he did on Inside the Ropes, uh at, you know, going from Webb's bag to Cam's bag and just being thrilled at the prospect of working with Cam at the time and all the talent he had. And I think it was right after that first week where he he uh finished runner up in the match play to Sam Burns and feeling like this this could be the start of a really good partnership. And you know, obviously Paul is now on Tom Kim's bag by way of a, a caddy carousel that saw um, um, why am I forgetting uh, Joe Scoverin, uh going to Ludwig O'Berry's bag, which, okay, that makes sense. You know, he's, that's a generational talent, but you know, initially the move was to Brendan Todd's bag, you know, yeah, that was always so, going to be a, a couple week thing. Um, yeah. That was always going to be just a couple week thing. And Brendan knew that too. But, okay. I, I didn't realize that. Cause that, yeah, that yeah. was, that was also for me where I was like, that's a little bit weird. What's going on? Yeah, there, no, but, it was just a yeah. start, get to work. Um, yeah. Well, to, to you, you noted this as part of that larger cam discussion. And there are two guys that look, there's no real way to sugarcoat uh, the week that both uh, Keith Mitchell and Justin Thomas had. I think, you know, Keith kind of takes the, the, the final round lead. He starts the day at 10 under uh, shoots 77. Um, obviously, you know, you could see the disappointment on his face, you know, coming up 18, um, and, and finishing that tournament out and some brief handshakes and just getting out of there. Um, and then of course, Justin Thomas's, uh, Saturday, uh, I mean the stats here, this is from Rick run good on Twitter, uh, lost a little more than seven strokes gained putting, um, 38 total putts made, you know, a little more than 22 feet of total putts. He made a two foot, nine inch putt on the first hole. Didn't make anything longer than that. The Man, rest of the my day. guy should have brought. He should have got a cocktail at the turn. That's <laughs> something. <laughs> I mean, hot dog. Like that anything. is a hot dog and a cocktail at the turn <laughs> type of stats with the putter for JT on Saturday. Oh. Man, and that's one thing too. I think when you looked at that leaderboard and you saw him kind of creep up in a T one on a Friday, you're thinking, okay, JT's had so much success at Valspar and at that Copperhead Golf Course. He's a hundred percent going to be in the mix on the weekend. I think it was just a 
a total crazy outlier day that you just throw away everything. Uh, you delete control alt delete um because he has had a good year you know I, I think the players is a weird week where if you're a little off a couple you know two or three bad shots and you end up missing the cut um at players is kind of how it always goes at that place and uh this week i i, I think he's going to be probably a little let down with that saturday and, and sunday you know you once you're out of it it's, it doesn't matter at that point because i think he had been thinking about winning but um to answer your question on keith i, I would say that you know, he's a guy that's 72nd in the world ranking coming into the week. He's a player that's not in the signature events. He had a lot to play for. Mm. And I think the score represents kind of just the nerves that a player in his category, you know, those are legit thoughts and nerves and things that players are are striving to get into. They want to be in the signature events. They want to be in the majors. They want to have the freedom to set their schedule. And that is what locks up guys more than anything on tour is is playing you know free how can you get playing free on tour well you win to where you can set your schedule and don't have to worry about uh you know playing well to uh earn your way into events so uh, i think keith has been working his tail off i've been watching him uh on the sidelines for a while now um his work that he's been doing with his team it, it, it's coming um could it be next week would that be kind of the kyle stanley story of of Phoenix and San Diego, where he was right there on the doorsteps and wins the next week by four or five shots. Wouldn't surprise me, Keith, um, if he's playing next week in Houston, maybe I'm going to be my one and done pick. A uh, little, maybe the, I, I think I've kind of talked myself into this, <laughs> but. Um, you know, Tampa's tight, dude, too, as well. Like yeah. when you get off there, you can get going off in a hurry, especially if you start steering and around out there. Um, you can easily shoot a high score. Yeah, that that's the first thing that comes to mind when you when you lay all that out is like, man, if I was in that position playing for all of that uh, and, and taking a sleep on a lead on a Sunday, yeah. like this I'll is not the golf it. course I'd be wanting to play. I mean, what do you know? And just to kind of take a big picture before we move off this tournament, um, just thoughts in general about Valspar. We were talking a little bit before the show about it's just it's just an interesting week because it's it's kind of at the, it's at the end of this Florida swing. And guys have just been kind of getting beat up since they stepped on the course of PGA National. And, and you're just going course to course and you're, and you're at the end of this. And you kind of just came off the high of two signature events and, and, and these sort of marquee event on, on the PGA Tour with the Players' Championship. And so it's a little bit of a come down. But the, the golf course is just as difficult, if not more difficult, than, than some of the other courses they play. So you have that. You have March Madness. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's just a, it's a it's an odd spot. Now, in terms of the tournament organization, I mean, I feel like the organizers do a fantastic job giving it an identity. This is the most colorful tournament like they do a lot of cool stuff within that community. But I just wonder, you know, your overall thoughts on the spot and the, and the, and the spot and the schedule, the course itself, just the, the identity that this event currently has. I think you just look at the top of the leaderboard. I think anytime you get a Peter Malnati and a Cameron Young going at it down the stretch, you know, the, talk about polar opposites as far as yeah. how they play the game of golf. You know, have a guy like Peter who uh, doesn't hit as far. He's hitting it further. Uh, but Cam Young, a guy that can hit irons off a lot of these tees and, and, and just kind of, you know, think his way around the golf course a little bit and use power whenever he's able to, which you're not able to hit a ton of drivers out at that golf course. So I think the golf course has always had a great identity to be able to, you got to plot your way around. You, you really can't steer it out there. You have to be very good off the tee. Um, but as far as all the other stuff, you know, they've always kind of that event. It's always been more about who's made their way to the top of the leaderboard. Is anybody cool? Do I want to watch like is, you know, I think there's been years that Jordan and Patrick Reed had the playoff. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're turning that on, you know, like that's yes. a, a no brainer. Turn the television on, you know, was there, the, did the leaderboard have you turn the TV on this week? Probably not. You know, it's just, if JT would have been up there on the, on, on Sunday, I think you would have seen some, um, a lot of people try to tune in to see if he'd get that when he hadn't had in a while, but, um, you know, it's it seems like that's kind of how it's been for not just Valspar, for any of these events that aren't a signature event. It's like, can you find compelling names at the top of the leaderboard? Because you're either trying to sell a story right now or you're trying to sell a leaderboard. And and it's it's it, it's not an easy thing to do right now for the tour. And it, it is unlucky in some senses, because, you know, a couple of names you just hit like 
if if JT just plays decent on Saturday and he's you know in one of the final groups and in that yeah. TV window on Sunday, definitely more intrigued. Uh, how about Xander Shoffley, who <laughs> goes out and shoots 65 before the TV window begins? You know, so like you get a classic, little, dude. You get a little <laughs> quick interview with, with Kieran Dixon, and like that's that's what all you're going to get from Xander on the broadcast. Other classic than top five from Xander, dude. He's the best at, at top. Like he is the king at backdooring top top tens and top fives. Yeah, it's it's so it, I, I think it, it maybe if some of those guys are part of you know the coverage on sunday in prime time maybe we feel a little different about it but uh yeah just kind of a tough hand they got dealt uh on 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 sunday in some ways so that that's that's what we've got for the valspar this week um before we kind of fully went longer than i thought we would i'll say (laughs) (laughs) yeah looking down at the timer here 35 minutes ish peeling back the curtain that's that's a stretch i I I didn't think i texted you i was like man what are we going to talk about the mouse part this week (laughs) no it's just thank god uh peter malnati brought his son out for the interview because i don't know what we would have had other than that and then felt inspired to continue commenting after so watch this you know what's going to happen now is cam young's going to win the masters and we're just like guess what happened he found the dog in him (laughs) and it would it surprise you at all here's it i mean just looking at cam young stuff i mean dude he's had plenty of top tens he um, he you forget he almost won the the match play last year at yeah um i get against sam burns he lost on the 13th green or 14th green <laughs> but still i mean uh, i know i just kind of we're trying to steer into another topic but it would not shock me at all to see cam young win win the first major i i mean i feel like at different levels in terms of like, you know, where they're at and the world rankings and, and, you know, but I, I think Cam and Keith can both look at this week and take something from it and what they choose to do with it. We'll find out. But yeah, to your point would not be shocked if both guys, this kicked them into gear a little bit and we saw them play really well in the next month or so. So yeah. Yep. We'll stay tuned for that. Uh, where we'll head next is the aforementioned uh, YouTube drop. We had this last week, the front nine at spyglass Hill. Uh, for those of you who you know did not watch, you can go check it out right now. A little cliffhanger for you: we are we're currently two under through nine holes, and I believe we're like in the T sixties on on the leaderboard of, of maybe seventy or <coughs> maybe eighty total teams. So we we are attempting to make a move up on that leaderboard uh, against all the pro am teams that play the eighteen T pro am. The, the the concept itself, I'll, I'll lay out briefly, but essentially is just that. Every one of the pro amateur teams at the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am this year played Spyglass Hill one day. And so Smiley and I uh, are playing as a pro and amateur um, from the same sets of tees that they use at Spyglass Hill um, and and attempting to kind of work our way up that leaderboard. So, I mean, for me... I, I thought it was really cool seeing just the response from everyone who watched. Uh, it seemed like there was a healthy appetite for the content, hoping that we get to do yeah. more of this in the future. I'm wondering what your kind of takeaways were from our first <laughs> on-course piece of content. It was, it was <laughs> fun, exciting stuff. I you know I actually enjoyed watching it. I think the one of the things that I was surprised about was the flyers you're using from the t- Tiger Woods game. <laughs> that was something I like totally, you and I talked about it, but I, I just didn't expect it to actually make it in the cut. So that, that was that a surprise. That is from my original PlayStation 2 and my original copy of Tiger Woods 2004. I did not have to go out and eBay this. My mom saved all this for me. And I was like, what better time than, because it, because it, as we said in this video, I mean, Spyglass Hill is like a top five, video game course of all time and so uh, after we kind of talked about that in the video and i was like you know what what if i went back and screen recorded all the tiger Woods 2004 flyover as a spy and put them in this video and that's exactly what we did (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah i mean i i really think it came out great i mean shout out to uh 17th and ocean that helped uh, do this edit as well as yourself um you know like spyglass is sweet and you know i think there's a couple things that uh that we'd I'd like to maybe add is just another element to uh, to it. But I mean, so I would say it's a 9.5 out of 10. I was laughing. I enjoyed it. Um, I, I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. It kind of flew by. I was I was so ready to watch the back nine that I was like, man, um, it, it was really well done. I, I was I was really impressed. I'm, I'm not glad with my golf, not with my golf. <laughs> 
<laughs> Which, by the way, that kind of that kind of added some entertainment value. I mean, the, the bad yeah, golf turns turned into good content, so I enjoyed that. No, as you mentioned, Seventeenth and Ocean, uh, the the production company that is based out there in Carmel, um, did a fantastic job with it. So big thanks to, to Jonathan and Jessica Hugo. Um, yeah, and and a lot of comments, uh, you know, people asking what comes next. You know, are we going to see some more YouTube collabs? I mean, you're here talking about. You know, the Peter Malnati, the dreams of, you know, winning one in front of, you know, your, 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 your child. And who knows, like maybe, maybe you're, you're walking off the green, you just beat, you know, someone from good, good and foreplay and, and Anna Carter's running into your arms. You know, that dream's still alive, Smiley. We, we can still, <laughs> we can still have that. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We'll see about all that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the headline for, I mean, at least from my point of view, was glad people liked it. We hear you loud and clear. We hope to do more of this. As you all know, Smiley Kaufman's a busy man, wears many hats, <laughs> does lots of work. Uh, so it, working around schedules is something that we're trying to figure out, but hoping to do more of this uh, where where we can you know find the space and do some collaborations. So stay tuned. And at least in the short term, as mentioned, we have uh, Spyglass, the back nine of Spyglass, dropping on Wednesday. So got to tune in to see where we finish on that leaderboard. And then I think the most entertaining one is going to drop uh, in two weeks, which is uh, the Pacific Grove, the nine holes we play, the back nine of Pacific Grove, which was <laughs> going to be epic. <laughs> oh, my. I mean, this edit has been truly fun to watch because it was we played this on the day that uh that the at&t pebble beach program was canceled for weather it was 60 <laughs> mile per hour gusts we met up with three guys on the muni one of whom was shoeless uh so i'm very much looking forward to that one. Oh, i can't wait to watch that one yeah so well um th that's the youtube piece just a few more quick hitters before we kind of go out of this episode um we listen as mentioned you've been traveling uh, you know, we, we've been trying to kind of do the best we can with you on the road, but we hear, we hear you loud and clear. Everyone on Twitter and Instagram was saying, please bring back swing notes. So we, we are here. We are going to bring back swing notes. We have a video submission on Twitter slash X from Michael Swinson. Ooh, uh, he says, I'm let's a, go. He's a five handicap. He's left-handed. Uh, he struggles with hooks, the occasional block more so with long irons. And most of the time, the ball starts online, but then it turns over too much and misses right. He thinks his release and uh, through swing is the issue, but shrug emoji. So without further ado, let me share this screen for you. And okay, we'll begin Michael. by Michael, Michael Swinson. Okay, Swinson. so let's let's can I get it here. a little want like bigger? I know I'm trying. Okay, okay here, here we, we go. go. Is this better here? All right. This yeah, is video one. It. OK. All right. Good takeaway, good hip depth, good backswing. Yeah, good golf swing. That's okay. a five handicap, huh? That's a that's what five handicaps are these days. This man's ready to take your money. Do you want me to stop at any point? You want to like no, break? Do you, do you no, want to see video it. too? So it's kind of an awkward looking finish. Um, it looks like something's off, but. No, dude, he's got a great mechanics. I, I would say that in the downswing, I think his hand depth gets a little bit towards the ball. I almost honestly feel like if he felt like the butt of the grip went almost back behind his left heel for just like just the first couple moves where he gets to his right arm parallel to the ground, I think that would help just keep the golf club hitting it a little bit more from the inside. And then from there, I think from him, if he's struggling with hooks, I think that has more to do with running out of room at the bottom to where he has to, to stand the handle up a little bit. So if I can if I can get him feeling like he keeps his arms a little bit more behind him in transition, I think that will help him first be hitting it a little bit more from the inside. He'll be a little bit more shallow. And then I think he needs to just feel rotation with a held face and I don't think I'll ever struggle hitting the hook again, but he needs to go chip and putt because there's a lot of really good stuff here. Because if you're a five handicap with this action, I think there's more issues with with course management, and chipping and putting. Hmm, that hits close to home. Uh, so tell me about what what is the feel he needs with like you're talking about like like that butt of the grip the right hands. there. Yeah, yep. you see yep. how that 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 butt of the grip starts moving a um, little bit towards the golf ball. Like I would like to see Got that. It be just a little bit more 
almost really look like it goes a little down. Like I want it to Got feel it. pull down instead of towards the ball. Yeah. So I don't Kinda want him to pull his hands yeah. towards the ball. I want him his hands to feel like they stay behind for just a, just a second. And I think that'll help um, uh, just a little bit with, uh, with kind of that through pattern he's talking about. Let's, let's briefly check out video too, just to see what we got here. Uh, this is, this is real time to see if there's anything else you see here. But, uh, this is, uh, this is the second video that Michael sent in. He's not a five handicap. He needs to, to <laughs> uh, he's standing a little too close to the ball there. Okay. Um, but that would be just like a setup thing. Like to me, he's, um, probably could stand just an inch further away from it and just get a little better setup. But, uh, I like his action. I think just a little bit of that feel would be all he needs. And I think that'll help get a little shallower divots and he's, you shouldn't have any right misses. I would definitely make sure he goes and gets fitted properly because I don't, I don't see five handicap in this because if, if he's having some big misses that are, that are questionable, I think that could be a fitting problem too. The, the, the lie angles could be off and also uh, maybe his shafts at the top of the bag are, are a little, little funky too. So. I would definitely encourage him to make sure that his his uh, his stuff is properly fit. There you have it. So, Michael, so your big takeaways are, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's we're going hand depth, we're going uh, set up, like standing cl- too close to the ball, and we're going go get fit, go go get your go get your so lofts, your, your line angles checked. So instead of here, we're gonna go. So not there. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Love it. Well, this has been another successful uh, installment of Swing Notes. Michael Swinson, hope you uh, enjoyed those. And just notes for everyone else, keep keep sending in videos. I've got a lot of them uh, on the backlog. Apologies, we, we can't get to everybody every single week, but we will continue working through these. And uh, we appreciate you uh, participating. Uh, we are going to move now to the Houston Open. It's a new spot in the schedule uh, and, and the and the not in the fall as it has been in past years, but uh, now taking the place of what, what was the I match. I they're overseeding too. Because like in the fall, it's been Bermuda. I think it's an overseeded wall-to-wall, which is, I think, going to look better on TV than it did in the fall, which is like it, dormant fall Bermuda. What, it, was it dormant? I'm trying to remember. It went dormant, but you know, it like right. Bermuda just doesn't show as well on TV yeah. like, a, like a green overseed. So like, are we talking like a rye overseed or like, I know yeah, a lot of yeah. places That's kind of what we've seen this entire... This entire Florida swing has been. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so that's, that's the golf course piece of it. I don't have a ton of additional notes for you there, but what I did want to do is uh, debut a new segment called handicap management. Okay. And this is not handicap management in the sense that like Charlie Hume, who, you know, missing putts to make sure his handicap stays around a five or six so he can not lose money on the weekends. This is handicap in the gambling sense uh, because we do not have a set of odds yet for this tournament. Um, we were talking offline. Do we think Scotty Scheffler is even odds this week? Cause <laughs> I, I am 100% positive that Scotty's going to win this week and win the masters. So win four starts in a row, but we were talking about the odds and it occurred to me, it could be a fun little exercise. A lot of these shows we do on Sunday or Monday before, you know, the kind of the betting odds are out to just, we're going to guess now at time recording, looking at a field list, what the betting odds are going to be. You, of course, are going to have the luxury of watching this later when they're out. And you can see how how close or far away we were and, and have that fun little payoff on your own. So let's let's take a look at the field for the the Texas Children's Houston Open. And let, let's let's just start at the top. We 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 listed it. What is uh what do we think Scotty Scheffler's betting odds are gonna be? <laughs> I joked with you that it was gonna be even odds. And I, I kind of curious what the lowest Tiger Woods' odds ever got to win a golf tournament. You know, like, I think it was even he... money at one point. I think no, it was literally it wasn't. no chance. Was it really? There don't you remember that was like the famous, you know, uh like line. It was like there was like a tiger versus the field bet. Literally, you could take the field or tiger at even odds. I mean, I don't think I don't think that was like for some extended period of time, but like I'm talking like like 2000, you know, like 2001, like right in there, like it, there there were tiger versus the field was a real thing. I mean, I think three to one. I think it'll be three to one. So that's which plus so three hundred, sh- right? Yeah, that's so short. Stupid. Because like normally, what's the 
you know, is it kind of around five to one is where like something like a heavy favorite would be at five to one? Well, I think we were looking at, weren't we looking at Masters odds last week? Or I'm trying to, maybe yeah, I'm, I'm going to do some Masters odds. I think he's plus 450 to win the Masters right now. And I think Rory is the next shortest odds, like plus 1,000 or plus 1,100. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, dude, plus 450 to win the Masters is ridiculous. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, with, with, I mean, especially the, the next, you know, the next closest guy has, you know, <laughs> whatever, more than double your odds. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, okay, so you're thinking you're thinking three to one. <laughs> Dude, that's so short. Is that what it's gonna be? You think it's three to I, one, right? I, I don't hate like I would I would even say like plus two fifty. Like, <laughs> okay. I, I, I think we're in the we're in the we're in the plus two fifty plus three hundred range for Scotty. Um which all and, and this kind of it also depends on like field strength a little bit too. And this is this is actually a, a it's a good field. Hmm. It's a good field. So, okay, so let's go then next to the, to the guy that makes the most sense. And I don't know how many of these guys will do, but let's just kind of reel off some big names. Uh, Wyndham Clark, the man who's finished runner-up to Scotty in his playing? last two starts. He's playing. He's in the field, according oh, to wow. this. I, I, as you're, as you're uh, breaking it down, let me just uh, ensure that he hasn't withdrawn in the time since I uh, last uh, last checked. But, yeah, that Wyndham is in the field, according to the, the tour website at the moment. Okay. Um, are we doing one and done right now too? We're going to do that after this, but okay. we're, I was going to start with these because this kind of sets the table a little bit for some of the okay. names in the okay. field we may or may not take. Yeah. Uh, are you asking me what Wyndham's odds will be? Yeah. I mean, we could workshop it together. I mean, do you want me, do you want me to go first? Do you want me to tell yeah, you what you I go think first. Wyndham's going to be? All right. Yeah. I think Wyndham, I think if Scotty is like plus 250, plus 300, I could see Wyndham being like a, let's say like, let's say plus 900 for Wyndham. Is that the next guy? That's think nine. I, I think I, I would guess that's the next guy. Holy crap. That's a big gap. I mean, because, okay, let, let's think, look at some of the other names. I mean, like, you know, so hit the galls in this field, Willie Tony Finau, Willie Z. Like there are some names in this field, but I, I think it's pretty clear on form. Finau won last year by four. Are you taking Tony Fiena over <laughs> Wyndham or Scotty right now? Because if you are, I got some real estate to sell you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, yeah, it's yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, nine to one. It's, I feel like that's right around. He'd probably be the second shortest based on what we've been seeing. Those two. I mean, I'm wondering if I should bump that to like eight to one. Like, uh, I was going to probably days. go plus seven fifty. I guess I, I like that. I'm not great at this stuff. Like I, I think head to head matchups is a little yeah. easier to predict. I think these, I I probably need to start looking at odds boards more. I just don't, don't look at them too often. This is so. good. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing exercise. We're going to learn. This is going to, this is going to, how we're going to get good at this. You know, we, we can only practice, <laughs> you know, to get good. So that that's perfect then. Okay. Let's go next to Tony Finau giving Tony's current form defending champ. I, I would assume he's the third guy that's going to be on this board. I could be wrong. Where do you think to where do you think Tony's going to land uh, in terms of odds? He's probably in the top ten. I, I don't think he'd be top five though, would he? It would probably you don't think be, he'd be top five in odds as a defending champ. Really? Maybe <laughs> different time of the year. No. Do you think I was top five on the odds board after the Shriners Open in 2016? <laughs> I would have hoped so. I don't know. Uh, I probably <laughs> would say no. <laughs> Just because you won the year before doesn't make it your top five in the odds boards the next year. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like you get a little bump based on venue. Sometimes it's a sucker bet, you know, oh you kind of try to reel you in. I mean, I don't know. Like, I like, I, I think, I think Tony, I think Tony will be. 1200 like, plus yeah, 1200. I was, say, I was gonna say like 13 plus or 14 to 1 plus 1200 yeah. sounds about right okay Is that then, top five I, I I'm not sure you know okay then let me let me let's go Willie Z next do you think Willie Z is gonna have shorter or he'll, longer he'll be shorter 100 percent shorter okay what do you he'll think, be in that think? plus he'll be in that plus a thousand range probably 10 to 1 like right behind like it'll probably be Wyndham at plus 800 like you were saying then Willie Z at plus a thousand and then uh Tony plus 1250 or something like that so yeah, okay. maybe right around top five. Yeah, you, you're right on it. Okay, so then all right, this is the last one we'll do. Uh, in our we'll do five player a little exercise here, and 
let's go Sahith the Gaul to close us out. And let me just read you like Sahith's current or most recent form. So his last five starts, T9, T6, T37, 5th, T20. So like pretty some pretty solid form. T20 at players? T9 at players. T9 at players? Yeah. Did I, I picked him at the players, right? You did pick him at the players. Remember, he started yeah. the day at 12 under <laughs> alongside Scotty Scheffler. And, uh, I like Sahith this week. I do like Sahith. Okay. So, and I like him more than Tony on the odds board. So I'm going to go, I think he'll have shorter odds. Than, do you have shorter or longer than Will Zalatoris? Longer. So we so okay. So let, uh, that, actually, probably about the same. Um, I would put them both at plus a thousand. Both and plus Willie Z and in, in Sahith right at right at plus a thousand. I, I'm I, even though Will missed the cut. The players, I, I think Sahith will be a little longer. I I could see Sahith at, at about plus eleven hundred, plus twelve hundred, and, and yeah. then Tony a little longer than that. Okay, I'm here for that. But I, I think we've stacked them in the right order. I think now we've kind of figured out. I think it's like I think it's Scotty, Wyndham, Will, Sahith, yeah, Tony. I think that's yeah. probably right, don't you think? I, I I don't really know who else playing, so <laughs> I'm kind of like well, I'm, I'm just st- taking I'm your scrolling word for through that. now, and and let let just make sure I haven't hit any big names. I'll just kind of read anyone notable in terms of recent form or or, or just you know the yeah, past no, year. I, I'm like, flipping Ox- through it. I don't yeah. see anything. Yeah, I mean, Oxy Ooh, I like Joel uh, Damon this week. I think Joel's going to have a good week. Bud Colley's in the field. Um, yeah, Joel. Okay, Jason Jason Day. You know, that's a guy to J- Joel Damon. Joel Damon and Steven Yeager, are my two <laughs> picks that are I think that could win this week as a kind of a trending type player. Okay, uh, Mackenzie Hughes coming off the finish last week. Like you know, yeah. maybe finds a little bit of form. Um, Dude, are all the Jake are all Knapp. Canadian golfers in form right now? Are any of them playing bad? <laughs> I mean, remains to be Bodes seen. Well, this year for the Presence Cup, doesn't it? It does. Keith Mitchell, of course, you just mentioned. Uh, what I mean, Keith, well, it's gonna be tough to handicap Keith, but uh, I mean, he's he's a guy. He's a name that's in the field here. Uh, oh well, I, I'll tell you one. I don't know where he finished the Valspar, but I think I found the one Canadian golfer in bad form, uh, Taylor Pendrith. Miss, oh, you're right. Yeah, Taylor's four, out, four out of his five last guys. He's a guy that there's there's a couple guys every year that, for instance, we're playing at the players. I'm like, how did the guys like where where did they keep their cards? Like, what event was it? And there's yeah. there's a couple of players at the players this year that that were like, oh, huh? I wonder I wonder how they how they kept their card. What what week did they contend? Because I don't yeah. remember. Don't don't recall. Well, I, I and I've gone through those four, those five names. I mean, I will bet my house that they're the top five names on the board in terms okay. of odds. I don't think there's going to be anything else there um, that that. So, yeah. So there we go. So there you have it. That was our very first installment of handicap management. We'll see if the segment sticks <laughs> around depending on the timing of our show records in future weeks. But we're, we're, we're trying stuff. We're throwing stuff at the wall. We're seeing what sticks. So um, let, let's, of course, close it with our one and done picks. Um, so here, let me let me just lay out how last week went. Um here is the good news for you. I only made 10.25 FedEx Cup points by virtue of my pick of Maverick McNeely. Here is the bad news for you. That's 10.25 more points than you made because Brian Harmon missed the cut. Your, That's your so thoughts? shocking, right? Brian, like, how does he miss the <laughs> cut there? It's a legitimate, perfect golf course for him. It was so odd that he missed the cut. It was just flabbergasted that that man did not finished in the top 10 you know i i think kind of to your point about the leaderboard at at this course like where you can have a cam young alongside of peter malnati i think like to me it's like anything can happen at this place but yeah i'm equally stunned it's like you think that even within the realm of anything happening brian harmer would make the cut and he did not so the four to swing man you can send every week on the four to swing you're probably due for a dud at some point because it's the golf is tough it's hard to play mentally to that to that level unless you're scotty um (laughs) and you you can take a week off so (laughs) well so you have first pick this week and and two of the guys we've mentioned in the top five and odds are off the board for you because you've taken tony fee now it's a hit the gala but uh who do you like this week? You're to just to run through the names you've used. You use Tony Finau, Vedanta, Chris Kirk, the Cognizant, 
Rory McIlroy at the API, Sahith the Gall at the Players, and Brian Harmon at the Valspar. So where are you going with your pick this week in Houston? I love Wyndham Clark this week. And I You're gonna burn him here? I'm overthinking this so much um that I'm not gonna take him. And I really want to take Keith Mitchell, but I'm a little worried about just the mental fatigue of playing as much as he has and like getting into contention and showing up to Houston and just, it's either going to go one way or another. It'll be a miscut or a win. I feel like it's going to be like right there. So I'm going to go a little further down. Just one of those names I just mentioned. And I'm going to go with Steven Yeager. You're going to go Steven Yeager. Okay. All yeah, right. I think I like he's it. a player that absolutely goes 110% at all of his drivers. If I recall, Houston's not a golf course that that has too much trouble off the tee. You just got to hit it hard. And he's a good he's a good iron player, good short game. Uh, he's been all around the top 10. And uh, based on I'm looking at last year, he finished in the top 10 as well. So uh, he's played well here. So give me Steven Yeager or give me death. I, I like where you're at. This is like this mirrors my strategy in so many of my like one and done pools the last few years where I, I get behind early and I'm like, I'm I'm throwing it all at the like I'm just gonna just throw up Hail Marys. Hail Marys every week. If I pick them, <laughs> nobody else does, like I'm gonna be good. Uh so okay, Steven Yeager. Um I Man, this is a tough one. I, I, it's actually it's not that tough as I say that. I, I think I'm gonna go Tony Fien out here. I know I think that's it's a good like, pick. It's the right pick. I I know it's an easy one. And my calculus here is I I think like if if, if you're doing your one and done pool at home right now and you're looking at your names, like, please do not use Scotty Sheffley here. I'm begging you do not use Mm -hmm. Scotty. Like there are other places either you've already used him like I did at the players or you're going to use him at the masters somewhere else. I I would also say to kind of close the loop on the dad talk, I'd use him before colonial. Because that's when the baby arrives, and there's no telling what I, I, I'm. I'm actually the bet I'm placing Just, is <laughs> the bet I'm placing is on Scotty Scheffler being a really, really good dad and helping out Meredith. Yes. And so his form dipping after the baby arrives. That's a it, good question it, it's about excusable. about asking about PGA Tour players. You you have to factor in is is where is their guilt meter? Where's the <laughs> guilt meter for the dad? You know. <laughs> How nice of a guy are they? And Just Scotty's down like, to, is he a good person? <laughs> we're, we're up here with Scotty, man. We're up here. He's not a, hey, let's hire three nannies. He's like, let's do this thing full bore. Just us. That's where I am probably guessing on on scotty there but i don't know he just won eight and a half million dollars he could hire 40 40 nannies if you wanted to here's the bet i'm trying to find like i've already looked into this like somebody allow me to parlay scotty winning the masters and the pga and not winning the u.s open and the open championship or That's missing the, the cut at US Open and you missing the cut. <laughs> I don't. I'm not going to go that far, but that's that's the bet I want because I I just think he's I think he's a good human being and I think he's going to be a good dad and that's going to happen at the expense of his golf game and you know what that's okay. But <laughs> we'll see. But, we'll see. But to work off of that, if you're like trying to put together a one and done pick, it's like I I, I think Wyndham is playing great this year and I want to save him for a major. I think the best is yet to come for Will Zalatoris. We saw some form early in the year, missed to cut the players, but I think saving him for later on is is, is probably good play. And then to hit the goal, I mean, I, theoretically you could use him here. I already used him, so you already but used him. I mean, that's I, I all liked, I got. I thought him. he was going to finish top. Like I thought he had a chance to win the players. I, I thought he would be a sneaky guy that I could kind of burn there. Um, it was a risky play, but he's just been yeah. in such good form. But he, he, he'd be a great pick. He finished. <laughs> Um, yeah. he finished 22nd there last year, shot 64 on Sunday. Well, and you, and you and I kind of both did the same thing in terms of using Tony Finau. Like he's streaky, but like, let's use him at the places where he, we know he can play well, use him at Vedanta big track you know, where he won. I'm going to use him at Houston Good iron where he's won. So like, that's kind of the calculus that goes into this, but yeah, I mean, a little bit boring, chalky pick, but it's that time of the year. It's Mars madness. So yeah. uh, we're going to, we're going to go chalk. So one other player I want to mention just as like okay. a, DFS per player for if anybody's like trying to fill out a lineup. I like Aaron Rye this week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I assume he's playing. <laughs> Don't even know if he is, but let me, if he is playing, I like Aaron <laughs> Rye to kind of be a, a glue guy. Uh, let, me, let me just confirm. He is playing. I'm still scarred from you saying uh, uh, I really like Tyrrell Hatton this week at the API and me just nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great pick. I really like that. Like, oh, no, he doesn't play on this tour anymore. And um, if Jake yeah. Knapp's playing too, I think he'll have a he good is. week. 
Jake yeah, Knapp's it's, a, it's another well. good track for him. So Aaron Rye, Jake Knapp. Okay, great. Yeah, as we know, Jake Knapp plays well at courses that Tony Finau plays well at. So uh, take him here. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, Sam Bennett got a sponsor's invite. Yeah, you sure That's did. interesting. He he could play well. What do, what do we, where do we think Nick Dunlap's going to play well again? Or are you just going to kind of take him time to get back into form? Is he playing? I don't even know if he's he, playing he's, this week. He's in the field this week, yep. He, okay. Uh, this is a good track for him. He's a good iron player. Um, doesn't have to drive it quite as good. Yeah, give me Nick Dunlap this week. He's, uh, you know, he he got in contention at Cognizant. Uh, didn't have a good weekend. He's just learning how to be a pro, man. And yeah. I, I think it's that four to swing will wear you out. I think he'll be excited to get to Houston and just be like, okay, um, it's a tough golf course. It's hard, but it's I think something a little bit more uh, in the wheelhouse of what Nick's probably comfortable with, not the crazy uh, rough that he's been playing on the on the uh, on the East Coast in that four to swing. Yeah. Well, there you have it. There's some one and done options, some DFS options. It's of course, you know, that, that, that's the, 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 the flip side, the balance scales are if we do the show record early, you're going to get handicap management because it's going to be pre lines, pre DFS prices. If we do it later in the week, you will get the DFS lineup because that's, we're going to have all that information, but that's, that's the help we have for you this week. We hope it is helpful. Uh, and yeah, and, and I guess you will not, as we are, we are still kind of waiting to put together, you know, some information about where we are headed next. We're very excited about that, but there will not be a midweek pod again this week because we're doing all this on YouTube and what you will see, as we've noted before, is the back night spy glass hills. We hope you enjoy that on Wednesday night. It will be a 7 PM Eastern premiere as it was last week. So join us, you know, comment along and you know, we'll, we'll respond to as much of that as we can. Um, but that, that's all I have this week. Smiley, any, any closing thoughts for the, for the viewers out there? No, uh, excited to get to Houston three week stretch coming up. I feel like I'm, uh, definitely ready to get, uh, back to work after a good vacation at Baker's. So Houston, San Antonio, Augusta, three weeks in a row. Um, excited yeah, about Augusta. Ready gets a, it's kind of the end of the end of my swing. Excited about Augusta. We got some plans working. Could be a really fun week. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned for that as well. So thanks everybody for, uh, for watching and yeah, tune in on Wednesday for the back nine. It's bye. I've actually watched a couple of episodes of, of, of y'all earlier and uh, you guys have some good takes. So thanks for, uh, thanks for what you guys do. It's cool to see what you guys are doing. And uh, we, I, I know golf fans appreciate it, but we, we do too. So please keep it up. I think you're doing a tremendous job and, and you know, I listen to this podcast. It's really cool. And